which is a relatively new research center that we've got uh, here in the College of Architecture. I'm the director, and uh, we do research on uh, and sponsor projects for communities and places uh, with intact cultural heritage. Um, sustainability uh, concerns both the uh, cultural and natural systems of human existence. And so our uh, Center for Cultural Sustainability, obviously, is concerned with those cultural systems. Um, we're exploring the continuity of those cultural systems. Continuity is a really important word for us, and especially the aspects of built cultural heritage that connect with the identity of people at a particular place. Um, of note to you students, um, there is a thesis prize, or a master's project prize, depending upon which you're pursuing, uh, for cultural sustainability. And you can find out more details on that uh, on the uh, center's website. And if you're looking for the address, I've got some bookmark cards here, and you can pick up from me afterwards. And uh, if you just do a search of our UTSA uh, College of Architecture or the university, you'll easily be able to find uh, information on the Center for Cultural Sustainability um, and read more about what we've been doing and uh, uh, what we're attempting to do. So that prize uh, does come with a small reward, but mostly it's the, it's the joy of winning a prize and being able to put it on your resume. So, uh, so look for that, and hopefully we'll be giving out the first winner um, this uh, coming of May. So for those of you picking your thesis and master's projects, uh, you'll look for that. Um, so now, on to our, our speaker. Um, I've been fortunate enough uh, to make multiple visits to Havana uh, over the past six years. Uh, I, I seem to be able to get there approximately twice a year, and uh, sometimes three times. And all, almost all of my visits there have been focused on Ernest Hemingway's home, uh, Finca Vigia, or Museo Hemingway, as it's known in, in Havana. A very popular site, both for tourists as well as for Cubans. Um, so in the course of, of doing my work there, um, where I'm a, a technical team leader for a bunch of uh, U.S. experts that assist the uh, colleagues and uh, peers in Cuba who are actually responsible for the restoration. Uh, we're sort of an advisory group. But in the course of doing that, I uh, became enamored with the city of Havana and wanted to learn more about it and meet people who knew about it. And as I asked around uh, my, with my colleagues and, and looked for published information, uh, I found the name Mario Coyula. Uh, would often, uh, if not often, almost every single time, people would say, well, you have to talk to Mario. Mario, Mario is the one who knows about the urban history of Havana, about historic preservation in, in Havana, about how the city developed, changed, and grew into what it is today. And that's always what fascinates me, is understanding how did this place come to look the way it does. And that's what Mario knows about Havana. And it's a fascinating topic, and I think it offers lessons when you uh, look at how someone else has come to understand a place, then you can also understand how you can go through a similar process and learn to understand a place that you care about. And Havana is a place that uh, Mario loves very much. It's his home. And He's one of the few Cubans living in Cuba writing about Havana for an English-speaking audience. And so his work is very accessible to all of you who want to uh, find out about, more about this. So I encourage you after the lecture to ask questions of Mario and then seek out his writings and, and read uh, in more detail some of the things that he's uh, written about Havana. Um, so Mario, if you're ready to begin. Um, we'll have you start right now, and uh, we'll give you the floor for as long as you'd like, and then afterwards uh, we'll um, open it for questions. Okay, thank All you, right? Great. Thank you. Yes. Uh, oh, I have to turn. I just shut it. You're going to talk for a long time. Oh, uh, yeah. Now, uh, yes, it works now. Uh, thank you for coming uh, this, uh, on this uh, evening or afternoon. We, we have a difference when we, we say afternoon up to when the uh, sky is black and then it's night, uh, not evening. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you for coming here. And um, uh, there has been a special uh, uh, wish a special interest uh, for me to come to San Antonio since a long time I had 
uh, been visiting the U.S. many times, but uh, was never able to come here. And I was now very lucky to be able to get to see some classics, world classics like the River Walk, and discover a place I never heard about before, but it's charming, which is uh, King William's uh, neighborhood, which is uh, fantastic. So you have a lot of treasures, and I wish you the good luck in preserving them and enhancing them, and in extending that uh, charm to the rest of the city, which is not that fortunate, uh, I should say. I'm sorry, I don't want to be rude, but... Uh, um, what I uh, wanted to share with you is some ideas about how the centers, of, um, about the centrality in Havana. Uh, there is a, a common uh, wisdom that says that Havana is a polycentric poly city, uh, I'm sorry, a monocentric city, and this is uh, wrong. From the very beginning, it was a polycentric city. To begin with, because it grew in a conurbation process, incorporating surrounding uh, settlements. And each of these settlements already had a center. So it worked as a collection, as a system of centers. But even more is that uh, the old world prison, which is probably, you know, designated by UNESCO World Heritage Site since 1982, uh, this uh, world prison of 143 hectares has uh, not one major or main square, but the system of squares, each with its own personality, without uh, being able to say this is the main, this is the principal, but just a system of uh, squares. And this fact uh, also helped in defining a strategy for the recovery of Old Havana, which is one of the, I should say, few successful programs going on in Cuba. Uh, of uh, recovery of the uh, built fabric. And this is um, because they focus around the main square, on the squares and around the main squares and along the connecting axis of those squares and finally begin to extend to the rest of the fabric. Uh, the thing is, I remember when um, Old Havana was proposed to UNESCO as a World Heritage Site and um, Amadou Matar Mbo visited Havana, and when he was taken around, he said, why only old Havana? <laughs> there are other areas in, in Havana that are worth of uh, being designated. But maybe the government was a little uh, afraid of, because extended designation brings together a uh, commitment to do something with that. And anyway, uh, what I, um, I'm planning to show to you is how the center, uh, center of uh, the center of Havana, the original Havana, uh, grew and moving uh, to the west all the time uh, and changing its character and creating um, a new centrality, but without uh, uh, eliminating the former. So it's like a uh, string of uh, centers in a way. Um, this centrality has been very much mm, damaged by the lack of uh, resources, especially in the last uh, 30, 40 years. And um, the, the old commercial, uh, traditional commercial center has been very much damaged. And I will show you also, especially after uh, what I think it was a wrong policy, to develop a new suburban center repeating the same mistakes as so many countries uh, did. And this center is sucking life, or at least sucking investment money uh, from develop, uh, putting that money into the old traditional center, which was very much used by everybody. And this suburban center is depending on cars. Well, you know, the, these kind of things. And this is uh, one thing I'll, uh, I think better go on with the slides. And, uh, so, talk to you about that. The city uh, of Havana was founded over there in 1519 because of the bay. As you can see, the bay has a very narrow neck. All this eastern part is a hill and um, uh, very good uh, ships in, inside the bay were protected from 
pirates and, and from hurricanes, both. And uh, the city, because the bay was an obstacle, because this hill was difficult to settle, and also because all this was military, uh, the city grew to the west. So there were walls coming like this on both sides, the land side and the water side. This is the UNESCO uh, site, together with an extension from, from the 19th century beyond the walls, when the walls were torn down, and together with the whole defensive, uh, colonial defensive system, which is impressive, uh, so much, so large, that you cannot understand the, the reason. And the fact is that it was not only meant to protect uh, the city, but to protect the ships and the wealth inside the ships. Because Havana was the last uh, stop of all the Spanish ships before sailing back to Europe, filled with all the gold and, and silver from America. And uh, for me, initially, and for uh, almost uh, two centuries, Havana was a city of sailors and soldiers. And all those fortresses were made from, with money brought from Mexico because uh, Spaniards found very quickly that uh, Cuba was lacking enough gold and then they went to the continent. It was, by the way, used as a springboard to conquer the continent. And, and later on, for some years, in the, already in the 20th century, was also used by the USA as a springboard to Latin America. Uh, this is the main river of Havana. When, oh, oh. The main river of Havana, the Almendares River that goes like this. It's not much of a river, and it has a lot of problems, especially pollution, even if uh, lately the pollution has improved. I mean, the, the, the water condition has improved, not the pollution. And it has beautiful uh, green spaces over here, but it's not properly used. The river divides the city. Actually, Havana was one city, and this western side uh, uh, to the west of the river was another city. I'm talking even up to early 1950s. And the whole idea is in using the river instead of uh, separate to connect. And this needs to maybe. Uh, what you did here with the river walk is a fantastic idea. Uh, maybe uh, Bill's uh, students can, can work something on, on this and bring the, the experience of uh, San Antonio with the, with the river. Uh, the whole uh, city originally uh, founded in 1519 followed the uh, typical Spanish-American grid that was uh, later um, officially registered in the laws of Indies from 1573. And so the same grid you can find uh, in the world present was extended to the west in central Havana. And uh, then with uh, some uh, changes also to this southern uh, part uh, that was populated by uh, Cuba's aristocracy uh, in the 1830s, 1840s, up to late uh, 1800s. And then a very interesting neighborhood appeared in 1859, growing opposite to the general direction of growth of the city, Vedado, it's called Vedado, from west to east, until it met around this uh, area with the, the older city. And well, there were, as I said before, many different uh, villages around that became part of a metropolitan area, but still uh, kept the, managed to keep their personality. Um, let me keep on going. So there was, just to uh, use this image, an old historic center over here with the five main uh, principal squares. Again, no main square. And then uh, some uh, some uh, transverse uh, streets running east-west uh, and performing as linear centers, but by pairs, because the blocks were so small 
that the streets were very close. And so there's one pair of uh, streets, more or less on the upper third, uh, Obispo and O'Reilly, and then there's another pair of streets in the lower third. Uh, and those, um, usually people, use, uh, it's interesting, they walked along one street and then returned along the other. This was typical of this. Uh, and, and the shops in here, the stores and shops, were very European. Uh, small shops uh, facing the, the street. And then uh, when it reached this point, there's an interesting building uh, I'll show you. And then all this area was developed already in the 19th century, especially after 1940s, uh, with uh, large department stores. So it was a shift from looking into Europe uh, into looking into United States. Uh, big department stores. Uh, then another, the, so the, you had the historic center, you had the, com the commercial center, uh, and then in this area where Bedado met uh, Centro Mana, uh, a, a modern center with a large concentration of modern architecture from the 50s uh, developed a very cosmopolitan center still alive, even if it has lost uh, part of its uh, life. Again, uh, here in red, you can see uh, these uh, centers I was talking about, the old historic center, the commercial center with some extensions. This is a linear center along Calzado del Cerro, another one going south, and this is another one uh, connecting with the old center of Marianao, uh, and this is La Rampa a place uh, very alive, uh, called La Rampa because the street has a slope uh, going into, into, almost into the ocean. Very beautiful, you see the water back down there. And uh, um, I remember um, a journalist um, who said once, La Rampa is not a place, it's a state of mind. And I think he, he was right. Well, again, this, uh, the centers I mentioned before, small towns that were assimilated, conurbated. But uh, this is uh, Kohima, where Hemingway kept his uh, fishing boat. And his keeper lived until he died at the 102 years, the man who uh, served as a model for the old man of the sea. And keep on. This is the, the Plaza de Armas, the square of arms which is the place where the older uh, fortress made by Europeans in stone in America is it's not shown here, over there. It's a fort that was built from 1558 to 1577. And when they finished it, they realized it was useless because it was so deep into the city fabric that if the enemy reached that point, the only thing they could do was lock themselves and wait. Uh, and, uh, but it's, uh, of course, initially it didn't have trees because it was for the military, and militaries don't like trees. And uh, then uh, they, um, later on, this uh, were planted. And this is a fantastic building, the palace of the Spanish governors. Uh, the, by the way, there's, I, I don't know if you know this. There was a time when the governor, Spanish governor in Havana, governor of Cuba, was also governor of Louisiana. Uh, Count Alejandro O'Reilly, and he was a nickname in, uh, in New Orleans, Bloody O'Reilly, because it seems he was a very tough uh, man. And uh, so the links with uh, Havana and some southern uh, Mobile, uh, New Orleans, Baton Rouge, uh, Pensacola were quite uh, strong. Uh, this is the, uh, it's interesting that the central courts are like uh, interior plazas, <laughs> especially, of course, courts as big as this one, which is very beautiful with double height arcades, beautiful. Uh, and uh, the pattern that was typical in, on, on those uh, squares was that the main buildings could come into the space of the square as long as they left open uh, a double height gallery for pedestrians. 
and it created a very nice pattern because you, you came along the street and the street continued under the building. This is a, a dry, another dry square, Plaza Vieja. This uh, fence was luckily removed uh, after this photo. And this was the last uh, building already finished, restored, and the whole plaza is uh, fully restored. This is an unusual plaza because there were no presence, was no presence of military or religious or, or civil, civil power, just money power, wealthy families that lived around. Another uh, interesting uh, square um, in the same area, in the same uh, wall present, is uh, Plaza de San Francisco, called uh, San Francisco because of this uh, remain, uh, church and convent. In 2002, a congress of the ACSA was held in this building because it has a lot of uh, big rooms. And even if the, building, uh, the plaza is named uh, San Francisco because of the convent and church, uh, that no longer exists because uh, the church sold it a long time ago, uh, the main uh, activity here was, because it was so close to the port, was trade related with the port. And this building from 1909 is one of the first office buildings in Cuba with a dome you can see behind and the statue of uh, Mercury, the god Mercury, not threatened. And uh, it's, uh, what, by the way, it was uh, damaged during a hurricane. They had to bring it down and fix it again. And it's all, the square is also interesting because it's not a regular square. It has some, uh, like uh, the main piazza, and then like a piazzetta over here. And it has um, uh, also no, uh, it's not surrounded by porticos, which is what happens in the rest of, uh, of the squares. The cathedral square, which has fantastic proportions uh, and has the, the main, uh, Act, actress here is the cathedral, the best uh, Cuban Baroque uh, building. And uh, all these uh, other buildings surrounding the space are, mm, belong to Cuban noble families, the Count of Casabayona, the Marquis of Aguas Claras, the Count of Lombillo, uh, several uh, Peñalver, Counts of Peñalver. And uh, it's uh, very much used and it has a very fine proportions. And again, some of these buildings, for instance, this building, Peñalver and the Marquis of Arcos, which is a little farther there, originally faced the other street uh, because this, uh, originally the plaza, the square was not a square, was a swamp. When they dried up the swamp and paved it, it became a very nice space and then these uh, families built new facades facing the new plaza. Uh, well, um, the Malecon is uh, one of the icons, the most probably the most uh, characteristic icon of Havana, or the waterfront. It's a seven kilometer long uh, waterfront promenade with a, a low rise seawall that actually performs as a giant bench. Well, here you, uh, there are so many people trying to sit in the, this day, probably a very hot day, uh, that you don't see the wall. Uh, then there is a problem because um, this was built at a time when the civil engineers, I'm sorry if there are civil engineers here, but civil engineers convinced everybody that uh, man could uh, tame nature. And now what happened is that nature is claiming back it's uh, tall, and there are floodings, the sea. Oh, you see here a very nice, uh, uh, quiet uh, sea, but it can become very, very rough. And then there are floodings, but even more than floodings, the problem is, that especially in this sector of the Malecon, the constant aggression of the salt spray. 
And this is a real problem because the only uh, thing that uh, resists this corrosion is the local stone. But there are very few buildings made on that uh, stone. Most were uh, brick and stucco and painted. And uh, all this is being repaired, all this uh, strip, that, uh, 14 blocks, the first uh, strip of the Malecon are being repaired by the city historian office and poses a problem. They are, they're putting back life here, like uh, restaurants and uh, bar cafeterias. But the thing is that people who lived on those buildings in the older part of the Malecon uh, were not the original people who were lower middle class and they, the buildings were well kept. But uh, people who live there now are poor, sometimes very poor. Uh, in a market economy, they couldn't afford living there because of, uh, well, the value of living in the front line, even uh, submitted to uh, threats of uh, coming from the sea. Uh, so what would be good for the buildings would be socially wrong, politically incorrect, would be a gentrification of all this strip with people who, be, who would be able to pay for themselves and repair the buildings so the city uh, could forget about dealing with those uh, buildings. When you get closer, uh, I'm sorry, farther from the original uh, part of the Malecon, more modern buildings begin to appear. Uh, in Bedado, this is the Havana Hilton Hotel, renamed Havana Libre. Uh, this is also a, a new building. And this is uh, what happened in Bedado in the 1950s when a law permitting condominiums was passed. And uh, uh, I always say that maybe in 10, 12, 15 years, the whole waterfront would have been a continuous wall of tall buildings closing the views into the ocean and, um, and crossing the breeze that cleans and soothes the, the temperature in the, in the summer. They used to be uh, like uh, very elementary swimming pools carved in this uh, rock. And something interesting, uh, in 2002 I was teaching at Harvard and uh, one of some of us, well, we were working with Malecon and several students proposed an extension creating uh, large pools over here so the, the, wa the waves would break farther from, the, from this front uh, facade. And in, well, one even included uh, a proposition to st starting here, build an, uh, a second tunnel under the bay. And this tunnel uh, would uh, also push back the breaking of the, of the waves. This is uh, Central Park. Also, uh, is a, this area, a pivot between Old Havana, that was on that direction. So the, this is uh, Obispo Street, and comes uh, from Old Havana. And then it reaches this uh, green spot, one of the few green spots in, um, in Old and Central Havana, which is also the meeting point of this very beautiful street, Paseo del Prado, which is uh, um, a promenade uh, that was, uh, well, very old from um, 1700s, but then that was uh, refurbished and given its present look in 1928 by the French landscape architect uh, Jean-Claude Nicolas Forestier. Uh, and uh, so it's interesting, this connection of a green axis, a canopy, where pedestrians walk a high, at a higher level than the cars on both uh, sides, but also on the a canopy of uh, green canopy of trees. And there are monumental buildings all around this palace that was built in 1927 by the Spanish uh, um, Association for Asturians, people born in Asturias, or some others. And, uh, and this uh, uh, building, huge building that was called Manzana de Gomez. Manzana is a block. In, uh, and this is um, a building following this uh, trend in Europe that you can find in Milan or 
the Vittorio Manuel galleries of Pacifico in, uh, in Buenos Aires, um, GUM in Moscow, with two diagonals. The building covers one full block, and it's all commercial and offices above. But this gave uh, rise to an area over here, later on the one I, I was mentioning earlier, um, since the 1940s with big department stores. This one. Forget about the horrible colors. This is part of uh, something that is happening. Havana was never a Caribbean city, but it's becoming one uh, accelerated uh, because of the loud uh, colors, loud music as well, and uh, a lot of immigration coming from Eastern uh, Havana, internal immigration coming from Eastern Cuba. And this used to be, the, there were very fine stores around here, but they are very depressed. They are lacking uh, things to sell. And uh, so it's, it's a rundown district. But this could have benefited a lot if the money put in the new suburban center would have been put into this area. More of these buildings. This is. Uh, a very fine, almost minimalist uh, building by a leading Cuban architect in the 50s, uh, one of the best uh, stores. This is a uh, kind of paint jobs that are doing very uh, edible. It's like uh, strawberry and vanilla ice cream or something like that. And this is like avocado, uh, green. And for some reason, this seems to fascinate uh, people. This is Obispo Street in the uh, late 1800s. There was such a narrow street with front stores, stores fronting the, facing the street. And it had awnings, like in Seville, to protect from the sun. And then this is the present uh, view of Obispo. These are the typical colonnades that extended along the axis of expansion of the city, like a fingers of a hand. And uh, there were, um, these axes were named calzadas, the, like the French chaussée. And they had these porticated galleries, double height, four pedestrians, like this. In, and in, it extended so. In the early 20th century, you could walk from the very origin of the city up to the outskirts of the city, not the periphery, and um, protect it uh, from the sun and the rain under these galleries. And this is something that has uh, been happening. Together with the big stores, there was an enormous amount, uh, thousands of uh, small convenience stores, corner stores uh, like this. This is the main street of uh, Havana, close to the university. Uh, but then the uh, Cuban government could not afford to supply goods to all those uh, thousands of uh, small stores. And they, they decided to close a lot of them. And then since there were so many people needing dwellings, needing a house, uh, they gave away this to people who were very needed. People who were very needed, of course, didn't have any money. And so they did uh, horrible things in very important uh, points, which are, the, which are the corners of a grid. The corners are the most important part of a grid. And this is uh, sometimes they, they didn't have in, uh, in money enough to put windows. This is a, a very elementary jealousy. So living here, it's lacking privacy, it's lacking ventilation, it's lacking light. And it's not a nice way to live and also ruining the corners of the, of the central city. This is the grid of Centro Havana. And it's a very regular grid. Centro Havana has the highest density in, uh, in Cuba. Uh, many people um, think that the uh, housing condition is worse in old Havana, maybe because the word, word old brings an association of things that are decaying. But the fact is that the worst housing conditions in, in Havana are in central Havana. Because they, they used the same grid, but the lots were smaller. 
and there, were, or, there was already speculation. Uh, ventilation is very poor. Actually, the temperature in this area is 1.2 centigrade degrees higher than the average of the city. It's an island of heat, and there's practically no green, very little green. But on the other hand, there is an opportunity. We proposed that and never received uh, an answer. Uh, most of these streets running north-south uh, are, well, they had, uh, in the corners, they had convenience stores that should be reopened. But also, trees could be planted because there are very, there's very little traffic north-south. Most of the traffic is east-west. And there's a possibility of, of planting trees in the streets and, and sharing the streets between cars, between pedestrians, kids, and why not, dogs also. And uh, the thing is that, uh, and that would be a possibility of putting uh, hundreds of trees in this, in this area. It's a pity, but it's not being uh, drawn. Uh, Vedado is a place that uh, was born with an aura of elegance. And of course, this is true, because they have mansions, great, fantastic mansions like this or this. This is smaller, but very nice. Or this, which is the, the house of the main character of a novel that uh, I wrote uh, just appeared in, in Spain uh, last month. And this is Vedado, an early plan of Vedado. First time with the streets were lined by trees. From time to time, the streets, well, the streets were wider and lined by trees. But from time to time, there were larger, wider streets with a central green median. And like Commonwealth Avenue, for instance, in, in Boston. And uh, from time to time, also vacant uh, blocks uh, planted with trees, benches, and all that stuff. Vedado, uh, as I said, al always had this uh, aura of elegance. Well, this uh, typical with the bro uh, marble lions, which uh, was a sign of nobility. Later on, anybody having the money could buy the lions. And, uh, but uh, Vedado was actually quite mixed almost from the very beginning, socially mixed, I mean. Uh, the, the important thing that made the difference is that the upper class set the rules, dictated the patterns of be behavior, dictated the look projected into the street. Not only you can find racism, you can find cl classism in this, but also it's a very simple argument to preserve the values of the properties because if the streetscape would be harmed by uh, aggressions, uh, the value would, uh, go, would go down. And this is what's happening in Vedado, which is the place where I was born and where I, where I live. It's, uh, I, I think I'll have a couple of images which are very frustrating. Many of these, all these buildings were set back with a front garden and a front porch like this. And now many porches are being closed and many gardens have been paved and built upon, and fences are, which were supposed to be always low-rise fences so you could see through, yeah, are being raised. And Vedado had a combination, very unusual, of centrality and at the same time green. It was very uh, well served by, but in a quite a disseminated way by theaters, theaters, restaurants, or galleries, whatever. And at the same time, it had some green. And I think the, also the more interesting thing is that houses were r quite uh, close to each other. But then from time to time, you, all the space saved from putting the houses close, you could open a, a one full block dedicated to a, a green space. I, I feel that Vedado still can teach us a lot of uh, lessons to Cuban architects and planners. La Rampa, this area that is what I remember I mentioned that where Havana uh, meets, uh, Central Havana meets uh, Vedado. Uh, is, this is the street seen from the, the, end, the sea is right here. And looking up, it has this uh, slope. And this is the beginning. This is uh, the 
roof of the Habana Libre Hotel. And this is a green space with a large uh, <clears throat> a cafeteria, which is the largest uh, ice cream parlor probably in the world, I think. It's a, like a, monu a cathedral dedicated, actually has some of uh, Brasilia's cathedral, some influence. Uh, and typically, it started with 52 different flavors of ice cream, very fine ice cream. Right now, I think they have two. They offer two. And this is what happened in Vedado with um, high rises that began to be built in the 50s. This is an uh, interesting building. That it's an exhibition pavilion that embraces an existing building. And this was built in 1963 for the Seventh Congress of the International Union of Architects and, uh, in Havana. The building by McKee, Mead, and White, the National Hotel, uh, in a very fine location over a rocky cliff opening into the sea, looking into the sea, and very close to La Rampa. La Rampa is right here. And this was the first uh, modern uh, building, public building in Cuba, built from 1945 to 1947. It was a complex of uh, offices, uh, ra radio stations, and, and TV, and this, um, and this uh, movie theater, which was originally named Warner. This building uh, gave the first push to, for the development of La Rampa. And this happened in less than 12 years. It was incredible how fast La Rampa was uh, developed. And I always said that they, um, in La Rampa, they violated the, the regulations of Vedado. They, they didn't leave uh, parterre. The parterres were paved. Of course, they, they left uh, holes for trees. Um, they paved the uh, gar front gardens. And they also, uh, there were no porches. They were mostly overhangs or something. Uh, and uh, even with this violation, the results were not bad. Uh, I, I don't know if I should uh, say this to many because this can, can bring problems. Uh, somebody said, well, then uh, if this worked, these violations worked in this case, why not my violations? Are, I can do whatever I want to do. But the fact is that because it gave the area a more urban, more um, central aspect without the front porch and the front garden, which was typical for single family houses. So this is uh, a consented uh, rape, I, I always say. This is the pavilion I mentioned before, embracing this uh, existing building. This is the slope of La Rampa. And this is a very Mesian minimalist uh, building, very fine with this very thin uh, in the form of cross, uh, tall columns, very slender. Uh, going straight into the, the roof. <clears throat> this uh, hill is the place where Havana University was transferred. The university had been founded in um, Old Havana by a religious university in 1728. And then in, at the beginning of the 20th century, it was relocated in this hill, which is a hub between Vedado and Central Havana. Very interesting place. With the, this is the campus, the rectorate building with this uh, set of four columns, four, uh, four sets of four columns. So you can see the sky be, be beyond. And these giant steps that remind the Columbia universities in New York City, but they are st steeper and not that wide. And even more, they're framed by a secondary set of stairs on both uh, sides with a different rhythm. I think this is uh, an improvement. And as it happens with all hills, it provides a very interesting uh, view uh, from up to down and from down to up. It's uh, very stimulating. Students' demonstrations came uh, running the steps protesting against the dictatorship of Batista. 
and three blocks after, they were met by the, by the police and there were very, very big clashes. Originally fist fights, later on uh, shootings. I, I have a friend who was shot uh, over there, but uh, luckily, well, I'm sorry, I won't say his name. He always said I, I was shot in the leg, but he was shot in the buttock. Uh, being a 45 caliber, it's not a fun just to have this big hole uh, pierced in the buttock. Well, actually, well, I said I was not going to say his name, but it's here, one of them. Well, it's not me to begin with. This is um, the first large monument made after the triumph of the revolution and uh, the first abstract. And uh, we are, were a, a group of four friends. We have been studying together in the same uh, year at uh, architecture. The four of us were architects, very young, 30 years at that time. And uh, the university is up there uh, three blocks away in a hill. So this is exactly the corner where the police uh, tried to stop the demonstrations. And this is meant, uh, the monument was meant uh, to pay respect to the people, students who had died through all the history of Cuba, fighting for freedom since the colonial days. And we broke away with uh, several conventions. Instead of uh, placing the monument in the middle of a square, we created the square with a monument. And this is uh, a, talking, uh, a talking wall, concrete wall, that changes its shape and, uh, and different periods of the history of the fight. Uh, for instance, over there uh, tells about the eight medical stu students shot, shot by the Spaniards in uh, 1871. And, uh, well, over there you can see it. Well, this is uh, the beginning of uh, revolts, students' revolts in the 1920s to create the autonomy of the university. And, uh, well, there are several, and this is the triumph of the revolution that we wanted to be. Uh, a finish but not an end because the fighting never ends. And uh, we try to play um, everything uh, positive. The fight was vertical, the wall. And everything negative, the repression, were like horizontal slabs uh, interrupting the fight. And this is how the, and this last monument, the, this horizontal slab is broken and grass comes grows from the cracks as a sign of life. The funny thing, the maintenance of this uh, area is horrible. Uh, by the way, there's uh, all those benches that were stucco, originally pink, but uh, the natural color of the stucco were recently painted in striking yellow, this kind of yellow, uh, without consultation. And this, uh, all the green areas are, of this area are very badly kept. But there's someone who is very carefully uh, cutting all the grass that grows from the cracks. So uh, uh, it happens. It happens. Uh, a, a monument I hate with, to Jose Marti, the national hero, maybe because Batista did it in the 50s. And um, it was a, a, a complex of uh, buildings, was supposed to be the new plaza. Civic Plaza, renamed after the revolution as Plaza de la Revolución. This building was going to be for the mayor of the city. And uh, finally, this uh, was taken by the Ministry of Armed Forces. And uh, this, I remember, uh, we were students at the time of this proposition. And one student found out that uh, this was almost an exact copy of a monument, a commercial monument to the Shenley Whiskey at the 1939 New York Fair. And they were using that for uh, the Cuban national hero. Well, anyway, you could expect everything. This is a view of the model. This is the former Palace of Justice, very fascist building like this, um, very much influenced by uh, buildings in Leo, in Rome, Mussolini's. Uh, and this is the square, which is actually shapeless. It only looks OK when there are 800,000 people covering the, the space. This is a theater, and there's a sports hall back here. The rest are 
ministries. So it's a, it's a void space, no life. No people live there, no people walk there. My, my wife, Marta, once uh, saw, uh, I think at 6 or 7 p.m., a, a naked man walking over here, totally naked and smoking a cigarette, which made things more confusing, more mysterious, because where did he carry the matches? And the <laughs> <laughs> but the, the thing is that uh, this is a demonstration that the place was dead. Somebody could, uh, could do that and nothing happened. Uh, uh, anyway, this is uh, CERT, actually, one of the th good things of the CERT plan for Havana in 5558 was uh, he organized this space as a series of like three articulated uh, smaller plazas. And this is what happened after Che Guevara died. This building that had a blank wall, and by the way, it's the best modern building in, in, the, in this area, uh, pictured a billboard in paper with the face of Che Guevara. And uh, being paper, they were forced to replace the billboard uh, very often. And I like the idea because, first of all, paper is uh, cheap. And uh, Che was an austere person. I think it matched with his personality. And also, um, there was always a uh, chair, but there was always a different chair um, designed by a different designer. And being a, a billboard, it was not supposed to be a work of art. It was design. So you didn't demand a, a very high quality as art. And then thinking they were doing the right thing, they substituted this um, face in, in paper by a, a permanent uh, design on iron which is ugly, and done by a very bad, uh, not an artist, actually. I think he, is, he works in stages for theater or something. But this is not the worst. The worst is that then recently, in this building, they, they didn't have a blank wall, and they invented the blank wall from the ground up, uh, tied to the existing building, blocking the sun and the light into the existing building, and with another Cuban hero, so you would have both. And this new one is even worse than the, than the other. So it's a good example of persistence in doing something wrong. <laughs> oh, this is the original Che Guevara. It creates a confusion because of the shadows. And this is the original building, of, uh, which is now the palace of, uh, of the revolution. I once proposed to. Uh, produce uh, pots, giant pots, into this uh, uh, gigantic colonnade so it will break, perform almost as uh, bristle and it will break the monum monumentality of this uh, uh, fascist building. More monuments of this uh, period, the 1940s, by um, first period of Batista, with this inspiration of, uh, in. Uh, uh, Rome in Leo in Rome. And these are some uh, proposals, propositions that were never carried out for Eastern Havana. This is uh, part of what uh, the creation of a new center um, that was called by the third uh, plan on the Eastern Havana. The fact is that this is the Moro Castle over here. This is the huge fortress of La Cabaña, which sits on top of uh, Casablanca. And over there, they would uh, build the presidential palace and some other facilities just to make Batista feel safe. Because one year before, he, uh, his palace had been raided by a group of revolutionaries. Um, remember the monument we did by my four, um, three friends and myself? The four of us were members of an underground organization started at the University of Havana. And this organization in 1957 attacked the presidential palace. And they were this close of uh, getting Batista, but didn't work. And so this was a way to put Batista away from the city and make him feel more uh, safe. Uh, Central Park is over there, over here. And this is a very, very special place with all those buildings, hotels, 
whatever this is, a Sevilla Hotel by Schultz and Weaver. And this uh, block, it's, there's a full block originally with this kind of uh, uh, architecture. Only most was demolished, only this remained. And in that moment, I was the head of the planning department. I put a regulation saying that any new building should have to incorporate the remain, remains. But not only to save the substance of the remains, but to give a kind of a push uh, to the architect to, do a, to reinvent uh, uh, this kind of architecture. But they, instead of that, they tried to copy. And they did these uh, very silly arches. And uh, it, the whole building looks like uh, cardboard, not, not, not like a building, and in a great location. So we always said this is a typical building that should have been a um, project, that should have been placed in a contest. All Cuba should, should take part in that contest, and instead of ending with this uh, very poor building. And this is a fashion I hate, uh, which is um, a mirror glass. This is a great building by Max Borges, uh, one of the leading architects from the 50s, a very uh, low-key building uh, facing north. All this was glass, transparent glass, and the whole roof came from columns that opened like a mushrooms and became the roof. Uh, Borges worked with Felix Candela a lot. And some years ago, the people from the bank decided to substitute the transparent glass that allowed to see the, these beautiful mushroom structures of opening up for mirror glass. So now you walk along here, you see your face here. I don't need to see my face in where I face it. And I cannot see the inside. This is a commercial uh, center facing west. The load of the air over the air condition is horrible. And this is, uh, well, this is uh, also a hotel receiving all the sun from the morning this way and all the sun in the afternoon the other way. And worse than that, they, it has only small windows big enough to stick your head out and get a smell of the sea, which is right here. So this is a hotel right by the sea, and you can even smell the sea. And this is what? This is a... Uh, a university that was finally dedicated to preservation, but I think it's a bad example. Because the, in that place, the original university ex, uh, was founded in 1728. The building was raised uh, totally, and in, in its place was built a modern building. Uh, this is in old Havana. A modern building, very ugly. Everybody hated the building, but it was very well built. Finally, after considering whether to demolish the building or not, they decided to remodel the whole building. And they reinvented the bell tower. Nobody alive had ever seen that bell tower. So, and then, again, the use of uh, reflecting glass with the excuse that it would reflect the beautiful facade. Well, not the most beautiful, actually, the worst of the palace of the governors on that facade. And of course, I have talked to people who work over here, and they say that at uh, some point at uh, 3 o'clock, they have to leave the, the rooms because the, the heat is terrible. Uh, more of this, uh, we are becoming modern. We have already supermarkets. Uh, and uh, well, this is uh, what happens. And this is the center, Miramar Trade Center. This is a model. It's to the west of uh, Havana, depending on cars. There are seven hotels. This is uh, one, two, three, four. All these were designed by Cubans, and these two. And then, uh, but operated as joint ventures with foreign partners. And this is the main street of uh, this part of the city, one of the most beautiful streets in Havana, Fifth Avenue. And this is a series of 18 office and retail uh, buildings, uh, also a foreign venture, a joint venture, but uh, with foreign capital. So all the money put in here to create a new center in a barren area 
uh, an area that at 7 p.m. is dead, totally dead, that money could have been put into the very center of Havana and it would have been much. Uh, but the thing is that uh, they are copying, they were copying the typical suburban center, depending on cars, uh, catering to hard. Well, I don't know if you know that we have two currencies in, in Cuba. One currency, which is the normal Cuban peso, in which uh, we are paid, and, uh, and we can pay some things like electricity or, uh, or a few things. And then another currency, which is 25 year, uh, times more valuable, that is uh, for the rest. So people, uh, um, people coming here have to pay when they go to shop uh, around here or if they go to a hotel, they have to pay in hard, this hard currency. Uh, this is one of the buildings. Uh, it's uh, a Jewish, the, the whole complex is with, uh, from, the money comes from Jewish uh, private investors. And um, this is the architect, which is a Canadian uh, Jew of these uh, buildings. This is another hotel, the and this one, both, uh, all the three of them are Cubans. And this is the, what happens in the old center of uh, Havana, the old commercial center. You have this very cheap uh, makeshift way of selling things, uh, very poor uh, artisanry, whatever, or sometimes, and it makes m me shiver with uh, fear, you, all this is pork meat laying there in the open without the refrigeration and, of course, flies. And uh, this uh, is a very poor uh, dwelling, and these uh, two women are selling homemade sweets or whatever. Oh, this is uh, a very, uh, uh, one of these um, uh, selling uh, vegetables, but also very poor. So you can find this in the very center of Havana. The centrality has died and has been transferred to this uh, suburban center, which is not a center. And this is part of the ruralization of Havana. The revolutionary government built more than 600 new rural towns throughout the countryside, hoping that uh, this would keep people attached, peasants attached to the ground, to farming. Uh, they made a mistake. They made uh, buildings five story high in the middle of nowhere. And people, after convincing a peasant to move into a fifth floor, and when he realized that he was in the middle of nowhere with all the disadvantages of living in a fifth floor walk up, of course, no elevator, uh, he moved to the nearest uh, town. And this contributed to the lack of uh, labor force. And one of the big problems we have right now is to, ra to raise the food for feed, to feed the population of Havana. And then we had these uh, concrete buildings in the middle of a banana field. And on the other hand, they were building these uh, very ugly, poor thatch roofs in the middle of Vedado, which <laughs> and bringing all the red, uh, very rich red soil of the cropping fields uh, south of Havana into a city, thatch roofs. Uh, this, uh, uh, this is all made with uh, palm trees. And this is a mentality, and this is uh, what I call the ruralization of the city. But together with these structures, is uh, a way of life coming, and people trying to raise uh, uh, animals. On. We have a neighbor, two buildings uh, away from us, that has the full uh, rooftop covered with uh, fighting roosters. And it's terrible, the roosters, because um, another conventional wisdom that is not true is that roosters sing in the morning in the, when the sun rises. No, they sing the whole night through. <laughs> like the guy who blows the horn of the train uh, in, in Bill's house. I don't know what happens to people here, the engineers, all the time are, and you, you hear that from kilometers away. Okay. Uh, more of this uh, small, uh, this is an empty space from a demolition, and then 
This is what the government, municipal government, was able to do. This very, very poor uh, store, of course, with no refrigeration. Uh, every, well, and this is an example of uh, how in Belado, uh, even um, with this aura of elegance, you could find poverty, but hidden behind classicist facades. This is um, what we call Ciudadela, which is a, a central court, long and narrow, with uh, rooms on each side, and then uh, common collective uh, um, toilets and, and showers at the end of it. What happened is that people started building their own uh, bathrooms and kitchens at the expense of the central court. And the court uh, was turned into a very small hall, a corridor. And these constructions, makeshift constructions, that are very much endangered when there is a hurricane, they also block the ventilation and the lighting for the, to the rooms. And then the funny thing is one of these uh, rooms, the family living in one of these rooms, have added two more floors. So now they have a triplex. And this is something that uh, kind of show what is going to happen in Havana in a more uh, uh, common way. Right now, um, housing, you can buy or, or sell housing. This is an area in central Havana. You can see the conditions. You can see how corner stores were turned into these uh, makeshift dwellings, uh, using the very high ceilings to create an intermediate loft, sometimes even projecting that into the street. And um, this is the part of Havana where with the highest population density. There are people living sometimes sleeping by, by turns. Because they can't uh, sleep all at the same time. That's one of the reasons for the success of Maricón. And these are also these uh, violations at the, for the urban codes, urban regulations that are producing this kind of people. Some very poor, some not that poor, some like this. What I call the poor nouveau rich. And, uh, and another convenience store, look at the, it's a catalog of uh, barbaric uh, things, especially this kind of uh, alien creeping up from the floor, eating the uh, corner. And this uh, kind of, maybe this is an uh, educated man, uh, Salomonic uh, uh, columns. And of course, and this is a present trend horrible. Well, here you have a detail. These balusters, which are like uh, uh, primitive uh, Mycenaean Venuses with very wide hips and big uh, breasts. Uh, <laughs> there's somebody producing this by the thousands, you know, flooding Havana with this kind of thing. And this was built, of course, obscuring the original facade behind. Uh, another thing happens in the rooftops. So there is a, another city in the rooftops of the existing city. And these um, constructions are generally uh, shacks. Uh, oh, this is the guy with the roosters. All these are roosters with a cage. He's very considerate with the animals. Uh, when there is a, a, th a threat of a hurricane, I don't know what, probably he takes all of them down into his uh, bedroom or something. And uh, or some people with a little more money are using the roofs as an extension, as a terrace, or with a small inflated uh, pool or whatever. But uh, I remember a long time ago, a, a, a very old um, uh, inspector in Havana told me that the largest shanty town in Havana was in the rooftops of central Havana. And then I always said, but um, if this um, intermediate makeshift uh, loft uh, are horrible. They are, are very dangerous because they can burn. They're made with wood. The steps are very uncomfortable. There's lack of ventilation. It's ugly or whatever. But if you do that properly, it's an in intelligent way of using high ceilings. Then you end with a duplex. And if you do uh, these checks, in the rooftops properly, you end with a, a penthouse. So it's a, it's a interesting 
it gives you a, a lead into, uh, into something that is not wrong by itself, but it's wrong because it's badly made. Well, this is it, Cuban flag, done by a very good friend of us that, uh, from Venice who passed uh, away last month. Thank you. Answer any of them uh, that you might offer about the lecture or in general about uh, Havana, Cuba, or uh, anything that, that comes to mind. Anything in the back? Yes, Whit. How does it work with, you were saying some people have more money than others, but I don't know how the economy works in Cuba. Uh, well, it's people difficult to, to understand. Uh, Maybe, uh, Mario, first repeat the question. To make sure yes, the question is, uh, what do, did I mean with uh, saying that there were people with more money than others? And uh, it's difficult to find uh, sources of income, of uh, real sources of income. Salaries are very uh, even. They're, the gap in salaries is not, not much. And uh, but the thing is that both low salaries and high salaries are not enough to make a living. And this has been acknowledged by the government. That, um, a lot of people have another sources of revenues. Uh, remittances from abroad, mostly in the United States, or they have their uh, sort of private businesses like uh, Paladares, which are uh, home restaurants. Uh, somebody in their living room or a part of the house is used for, as a restaurant. And uh, those who are, who are good make money. Those who are not good get out of business, and uh, and of course there is another way uh, uh, worth of uh, having money, which is stealing uh, from the government, which it became a kind of a habit. People uh, uh, black market, but it's very difficult because nobody will tell you exactly where does he uh, he or she gets the money and how much. But the fact is that uh, now we will get to see, finally, with this opening to a housing market, how much can people offer for a, a, a dwelling. I know that in the past, I have a, a friend who has a very nice house, and not now, more than 10 years ago, somebody knocked his door and offered him $80,000 for, for his house, which in Cuba is a lot. It's like a... 800,000 here at that time. I think right now, um, maybe people will start asking too much money for their, their homes. And what will happen is something I fear. First of all, this measure of the housing, opening to housing market has good uh, good side because it will make a better use of existing housing stock, which right now is only used uh, many times. Many times uh, People who have it, officially, you can only have one house in the city and another house in a resort. But there are people who actually own more than one house. And if they can sell it, somebody would have a house. That somebody who needs it can have a house. But also, uh, there are people, for instance, a uh, elderly couple or even a single person living in a very large house, needing money, and then there are people of the opposite. They can talk. In that sense, it will be good. Another thing, uh, it will be also good because people will take better care of the place where they live because it's no longer just a roof, um, a right, a citizen's right, but uh, it's a commodity. It's something that has a value attached and they will try to preserve that value or even increase that value. But on the other hand, what I'm afraid is that in time, maybe Midterm, midterm, uh, there will be there will be a more segregated city. People with more wealth will start use, occupying the best uh, dwellings, the best neighborhoods, and people with uh, with no money will sell, give away, or sell whatever, and then build uh, shanties. This can happen. 
Yeah. Um, you mentioned that a uh, whole part complex kind of following the American suburban model. Is that Not only hotel, hotel, retail, office space. Yeah. Is that something that's being taught actively at architecture schools in Cuba? Like that, that same model? I think not in the school, but uh, it has been discussed and, and reading about in the articles here. But um, most of the debate on architecture has been carried out, and this is an irony, not through the Union of Architects, but through the Union of Writers and Artists. It's a very powerful union, and uh, over there we have been able to discuss many of these issues. And, uh, but the thing is that sometimes we get to know uh, things when they already happen. They already happen. And we say, okay, next time we will be more careful, but uh, this is definitely. Yes? How does uh, transportation infrastructure and planning affect uh, these historic neighborhoods? And, and, uh, well, you touched a very tough problem. Uh, I always say Havana grew enormously and became a, a, the metropolis of the, the Antillian metropolis in the uh, early 20th century because it, it uh, was supported by a brand new infrastructure. Uh, streets were paved, uh, electric trams were installed in 1901, uh, a very fine sewer system was inaugurated in 1913 for double the size of the city. Um, there was a, there was a, was already a very fine aqueduct, and they ex extended that. Uh, was by the way, that aqueduct was a jewel of uh, engineering. In a, in, in 1893, and um, so the and of course telephone. Of co that uh, I don't know if you know that telephone was invented in Havana. not by a Cuban. You know, I'm not showing it by an Italian who was living. For some years in Cuba, and then Antonio Meucci invented the phone in 1849-1850. So well, all this infrastructure allowed for a, a quick growth of, uh, of the city. It's presently collapsed. So a lot of money would need to be buried, and nobody, no government likes to bury money. Uh, people, people like to see the money. They, so this is a big problem. I don't know if we could find foreign investors that would be willing to bury money, or of course there would be a need to find a way to recover that money uh, in areas of, maybe you cannot deal with the problem, at, the whole problem at the same time. You can do that easily by parts. We have been suggesting uh, since 20 years ago that, uh, the, that those sewers that were considered for double the population of Havana in 1913, uh, are already uh, inadequate for the whole of Havana, because Havana grew from 300,000 people at that time to 2.2, 2.18, because the population is decreasing and aging. So the the thing is that uh, half of the of Havana has access to sewers, and half don't. Uh, sanitary engineers. Uh, always think on, on pipes. If this pipe is not enough, they want to put a bigger and bigger and bigger, and this is the simple way they try to deal with problems. The, what we proposed is to deal with the problems right at the very beginning before they become too big to handle. And all this periphery of Havana that is not connected to the sewers and now throw effluents <coughs> raw into creeks and streams and rivers, uh, could have their own local treatment uh, using uh, organic uh, solutions like uh, water plants that filter the well, you know everything systems that have low entropy and could, uh, and this would be a way also to combine uh, the treatment of our soil water with uh, green spaces and but, um, we haven't found the, well, it has done, this has been done experimentally, but not for the city as a whole. But I think, uh, as with any problem, you, you have to break the problem into smaller problems and deal with them separately. 
And this is also what we propose socially with the neighborhood transformation workshops, which were small teams of uh, planners, social workers, very small, living and working within troubled neighborhoods. Uh, and dealing with the neighbors, they were people who were known by the neighbors or people that trusted them. And they could also provide a continuity to the policies of the local government. And uh, this is something that we had great faith in breaking up the problem of a 2.2 million city into smaller neighborhoods that have a sense of uh, identity, of local pride even. Uh, but what we realized, at least I realized, is that uh, in order to do that, you need a local economy. You want, if you want local democracy, local planning, local uh, culture, you need a local economy. And up to now, this has not been like that. The economy in Cuba has been very centralized. The government has acknowledged uh, recently, in the past two years, that uh, they need to decentralize. Centralization has a very uh, apparent logic. If I have too little, I have to centralize decisions to, because I need to be very careful about how I spend the little money. But I always said, reverse the thinking and think that you are having little money because you centralize too much. And uh, I hope um, things begin to change. And I also hope, and this may sound uh, weird, that they don't change too fast and get out of control. Yes? There's been a lot made in recent years about Cuba's uh, aggressiveness to protect certain natural areas throughout the island. Uh, and marine life offshore is recognized now as one of the leaders of eco sensibilities throughout the Western Hemisphere. Do you think that that kind of ideology, and of course it happens because the country's been in the freezer for many years, and uh, there's been a lot of limitations on development. Do you think that through the environmental movement that preservation and the care of cities may take root? If, in other words, come through the door of an environmental awareness as much of a preservation awareness? I think a lot of uh, advances has been happening in the environmental, uh, let's say, awareness. awareness. And some interesting projects have been moving on, like uh, using alternative sources of energy, uh, like using, uh, but mostly, I should say, in the countryside. Uh, we have a lot of sun, and uh, but we are only using that in very isolated places to put uh, light, let's say, electricity in a school in, in the mountains in a very far away place and um, using gas from uh, cattle and especially pigs. Pigs are great manufacturers of gas. <laughs> and ham, uh, of course. And, um, but uh, within the city, the largest, uh, the most important accomplishment has been urban agriculture. It's working quite well, and it has taken roots. There are hundreds of people who found jobs in this. And there are many different alternatives from people who work a, a small space practically for themselves or maybe for he, uh, the neighbor and two, one or two persons working on that field to larger uh, gardens employing uh, more people and receiving a salary or receiving part of the, out, uh, of the production. And uh, this is interesting. The problem with the urban agriculture is irrigation with aqueduct water, which is not rational to spend water that has been uh, uh, pumped, uh, transported, uh, filtered, uh, uh, adding uh, uh, chlorine, whatever, and then finally using that to irrigate the cabbage. So in some cases they also have uh, dealt with uh, windmills to pump the water from the underground aquifer. Uh, but the urban agriculture is something that has, uh, and very urban agriculture, uh, have a steady life. 
because some other approaches that we favored in the early 1990s when the Soviet Union fell and all the supplies uh, coming from their stock and it was a fantastic crisis. We all grow, grew very thin. I remember friends coming and saying, oh, you look so well. Are you working out? I said, well, not exactly. <laughs> and it happened to us, all of us. Some got sick, actually. But the, the thing is that uh, these uh, uh, things like biking, for instance, we were proposing that, and it was an incredible jump from 50,000 bicycles to more than a million in one year. Uh, but then people began not to use bicycles that much because it was dangerous, there were no helmets, there were no lights. Uh, and actually, I think there was no real priority given to this. And also, parts, spare parts for the bicycles were not, uh, you could not find them easily. So there were many of these things, uh, soft uh, technologies, uh, with the use of local materials and local expertise. Uh, many of these uh, things that are part of sustainability, we try to promote that and uh, some, as I said, urban agriculture has persisted, always just uh, faded. And this is one problem we have. We, we are not very, well, we are persistent in politically, but uh, not in uh, some other fields. Uh, I think we should probably stop here due to the hour, and if there's others that do have uh, questions, perhaps you can come up and, uh, and we can just chat privately here for a minute. Give another uh, hand. <laughs>